Well, if you're uh, sitting here in the room right now, feel free to grab a seat. And uh, while you're grabbing a seat, um, worship team, thank you all so much. Uh, if you have little people with you, you know that we're doing uh, services that are kind of all in right now, all ages. So if your kid, kids get loud, um, welcome to Kids Being Kids. If they get super rambunctious, we do have a live stream out in the lobby. Um, and so I invite you to uh, do that if you need to. Uh, and if you're joining us online, can we just welcome everybody real quick that's in the room? Welcome our online family. Thankful that you're joining us online this morning. Uh, if you could do me a favor and click that share button real quick. Um, we've already heard testimonies of people who heard or responded to the gospel because somebody clicked a little button with an arrow on it. So your share actually makes a difference. Uh, this morning, um, I'm going to kind of kick off uh, our, our mindset into the season that we're going into next for our church. Um, if you've been a part of the Rise for over a year, you know that when we reach the month of August, it means that we're gearing up for a 40-day season of prayer and fasting. Um, and it's, uh, I'm telling you, last year was incredible for this season. I mean, it was absolutely remarkable. There was testimony after testimony after testimony of people who just experienced breakthrough in their life. Like they were, they were held back by something, a mindset, an addiction, a habit, and it just it broke during that time. We saw people get financial miracles uh, in their life. Uh, we saw homes literally provided. Come on, good testimony right there. Uh, we saw uh, our kids' ministry, which was one of our focuses, absolutely explode. We saw the Lord provide over 16 acres for our church, for our future home. All of these things happened not by human strategy, but by a god size strategy, right? And that's where our church has always been. That's where we always want to be, is that we're not relying just on the things of our mind, but we want the Lord to lead us. And so for 40 days, we're going to press in as a church family. And I promise you, give the Lord a chance. It's going to be absolutely wonderful. Open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 6. And uh, that's where we're going to be this morning. The title of the message is, Should shouldn't should i got super creative right there and i got all the s words in there and if you say that really really quickly um you might get kicked out of church well not this church you'd be allowed here but other churches you know what i'm saying should shouldn't should we're gonna look at a, 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 a i just did it right there um we're gonna look at a, a pattern on how we should approach fasting and prayer in our life and so let me just read the text to start off uh, matthew chapter 6 i'm gonna read the 16th verse through the 18th verse Talking about spiritual disciplines. This isn't light, fluffy church stuff. This is raw, get involved, get in the grind kind of spirituality. We're going for it, right church? Not, not, not a self-help message, but a God help me kind of message. Chapter 6, verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces. That their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But... When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Amen. This is um, one of the only passages found in the New Testament that directly talks about the mandate for us to fast. And so I want to draw your attention just to those first four words right there. And I would highlight them, underline them, tweet them, whatever. It says, and when you fast. Here's the reality. If we're going to let Jesus lead us, fasting is not something for just religious radicals. Fasting is not something for just the really, really holy ones. Fasting is not for just the pastor to do or the worship team to do. And it's saying very clearly, when you fast, that all of us should have this spiritual discipline of fasting in our life. But the challenge is, in American church, we love comfortable Christianity, right? We like it when the air conditioning is at 72 degrees on the dot. If it's 73, I might go ahead and look for another church because that's how we roll in America. I mean, how many of y'all lose power this last week? Okay, so we lost power for about 24 hours, and I'm telling you, the moment power went out, it was pandemonium in our house. Like, the, like for the kids, I mean, they were turning off the lights. Uh, they have a little nightlight. It's battery-powered anyway, so it doesn't mess with the switches. 
The only thing that happened for them was their fan turned off. But you would have thought in that moment that there was absolute just destruction happening in our house and weeping and gnashing of teeth because a fan turned off in our house. Much less the fact that we do, thankfully, by the Lord's grace, have a generator, so we only lost power for about 15 minutes. But in those 15 minutes, it was just this oh my goodness kind of moment. And it's because in America, like we lack a, a threshold to be able to deal with things that are uncomfortable. We want everything to be so comfortable and so polished and so easy compared to a lot of other people who've walked out faith. I remember when I was in, uh, in Haiti, right after that earthquake many years ago, I was down there serving in, in the country of Haiti. Uh, beautiful, beautiful country, beautiful people, beautiful church we were at. And we're uh, in worship, and if you um, think that worship goes long here, you need to go to a, another country with a different culture and watch worship there. Like they're not on their third song, they're on their third hour of worship. And it's just getting louder, and it's getting louder, and it's getting louder, and the power cuts off. And me and the other five white people that were there, all from there, were like looking around right now, like power's going out. And every single person that was in church, other than us that were from a different country, kept going and didn't even miss a beat. And it's because in their mind, their faith is not based on comfort, their faith is based on Christ. It's not based on this super kind of cushy Christianity. They're going to go after the gospel no matter what is happening. And here's the cool thing about fasting. When you withstand from something, you get a little bit uncomfortable. And when you get a little bit uncomfortable, a lot of the junk begins to break down. And you can really see God begin to move in your life in a phenomenal way. And when it says when we should fast, like... This is not a Bible verse you need to check against the doctor. Now, how you fast, you want to check against your doctor, absolutely. For some of you all, going 40 days without food is a terrible idea. For others of you, it might be maybe you're going to do a 40-day social media fast. Maybe it's going to be a 40-day of giving up your Netflix subscription fast. There's a lot of different ways to do it. On our website, is a whole bunch of resources. But deciding to fast is not a medical decision. It is a spiritual decision. Again, use wisdom from your doctor, but whether to fast or whether not to fast is something that we should all do. We should all have fasting as a part of our rhythm. In, in Ephesians, Paul's writing to his church. And in the fifth chapter, Paul really kind of highlights a mindset that I think we should all have. In verse 15, I'm gonna read uh, 15 and 16, it says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. We want to be people that are not going off the world's patterns, but off of God's patterns, his wisdom in our life, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. We live in evil days, church. Like it's real. We see it now more than ever. I'm not going to prophesy and say the end is right around the corner, but I am saying it sooner than when Jesus said it was. Like, we are in evil days right now, and so we need to use our time wisely. And the worldly method would be, okay, if we have this certain allocated moment of time, we need to go ahead and execute all of our tasks systematically within a task sheet. But maybe God's saying, pump the brakes on that and just listen to my heart for a little bit. Maybe you need to slow down for a little bit. Maybe you need to get this other stuff out and just press in to me during this season. And I enter into a season of prayer and fasting, not in response to what's happening in the world, but rather in response for the hope that can be found in the world. Nelson Mandela has a phenomenal quote out there. He says, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. And when I go into a season of prayer and fasting, I'm not doing it because I'm afraid of what the news says. Or I'm afraid of what culture says. No, it's not a response to this world, but rather I want to be proactive, believing that the best is yet to come, believing that God is going to do something, believing that there's more than just this season. And if I would humble myself, pray and fast, maybe God would do something in me that can affect the world. Amen. Like that's the hope, that's the dream, that's the prayer, that's why we fast. It's because of hope, yeah. not because of fear. And so we know from this passage, without a doubt, fasting needs to be a part of our rhythm in life. 
Now, you and your family, maybe your small group leader, maybe another mentor you trust in your life, get some guidance on what that looks like. Keep that for, for yourself. But I hope and I pray as the pastor in your life that I can urge you and challenge you to take this season starting August 3rd, ending on September 11th, having those 40 days just pressing into God. But he doesn't just say you should. He gives some should nots as well. You ever seen people do things the wrong way? You kind of just scratch your head like, why are you doing it that way? Like, like it just doesn't make sense, the approach they do that at all. And that's kind of how the, the Pharisees are in this moment. They're, they're trying to flex their spirituality. And when I read this, maybe, maybe you're like this, I don't know. But when I read this, I go, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. And instantly, I put myself in the story. And I'm like, obviously, I'm Michael Yardley. I get how to fast. I would never, ever be the Pharisee. And so I look at like the Pharisee is the one that is getting it wrong, which they are. And obviously, Michael in our church is getting it totally right because we're God's chosen people. Which is true. We are God's chosen people. But sometimes, I look more like the Pharisee than the person who's getting it right. And sometimes there's some things in my life that are being done for the wrong reason rather than the right reason. And sometimes that may be the case for each one of you as well. Because what the Pharisees are doing in this moment is they, they are, they're like putting ash on their face and trying to look so, so like d deflated and so, oh, this is so hard. Christianity is really, well, been Judaism then, but it's so difficult. Look at how much I'm suffering for the Lord. I must love the Lord. They're putting on this big show. And in this big show, they're trying so hard to be so real, to impress people that don't care why they ignore the very person they should be real with. Woo! And sometimes that's us. Sometimes that's us. We, we, we try to put on this facade of spirituality rather than actually walking it out the way that God has intended for us to do it. This is what it's like. Our Valentine's Day coming up. There's this guy, he's got this awesome, awesome lady that he's taken out to dinner. Oh, he's so excited about it. And so he, he starts to go through his photos. They've been dating for a little while. He finds the perfect photo with the perfect filter at the perfect angle with the perfect caption that he Googled and he stole to put on to make himself look like he was romantic. Like he's got the whole thing worked out. I like guess it's gonna be the best post in the world. He tags her, he posts it. But he shows up late to her house, he doesn't hold the door, he doesn't bring flowers, and then he dips out on the bill. This is what it's like, there's this image of having it right, but when it comes to the substance behind it, it's lacking. And that's what's going on with these Pharisees right here, is they're totally missing it. And like, I, I get it wrong sometimes. I, I know one of our favorite pictures for our family is when, um, when Abby came home. Uh, we all know that she was, uh, had, a, had a really, really tough first two weeks, and we got to bring her home for a family wedding, and we had this picture where like our whole group, it was the, the five of us at the time, we're all sitting in the, in the hospital, we're all smiling, it's this beautiful picture, like it's one of my favorite pictures, because it shows the promise of God taking place. And I'm like, oh God, thank you for that. I look at that picture, and I thank the Lord for it. So Charlotte's born a couple weeks ago, and we get home. And we've been home for, I don't know, maybe four or five hours. And we bring the whole family outside on the front porch. We set up a camera and like everybody's kind of fighting. Everybody's kind of fidgety in this moment. The picture's not going right. And I'm like talking to Ezra. I'm like, Ezra, smile for the camera. We need to have a good family picture right now so we can post it on social media and everybody can know how happy our family. Getting it totally wrong. Like going for something when the substance behind it is not correct. And I wonder how many times that goes into different areas of our life, particularly our faith, where we want to have the external look of something, but the private life, perhaps, ooh, or maybe even the secret life, perhaps, isn't measuring up the way that God has called us to do it. So not only does he call out, he says, you, you should pray, you shouldn't do it like this. You should fast, you shouldn't do it like this. Not only does he say should, shouldn't, but then he comes back, thank you, Jesus, because he knows how hard-headed I am and how much help I need. He gives me some direction. He gives me some direction. And he says, here's what you should do. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. 
that your fasting may not be seen by others, but your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You know, they, they say that you have three parts of your life. They say that you have your public life. That's what everybody sees. That's the image you put out in relationships. That's the, that's the image you put out at work. That's the image you put out with your friends. And I'm not against the public image by any means. You, you want to put your best foot forward, I'm totally for that. So there's the public image, and there's the private. That's why people can see like what your house looks like sometimes. That's when people can see that you don't always put your dishes in the dishwasher right away sometimes. That's when people can see you maybe lose your cool a tag with your kids sometimes. I know I'm not talking to this church, I'm talking to other people that might struggle. Like this is, this is the other side of your life. So you have your public life, you have your private life, but then there's the secret life. And that's the life that almost nobody knows about. That's the one that you would be ashamed sometimes to share. And what's so interesting to me is that in this passage, it doesn't say your father who sees you in public. He sees you in public. He sees everything you do in public. He knows every thought you've had, every prayer you've made, every declaration, every one-handed signal you've given in traffic. He knows it all. There's your public side, right? He sees it all. He doesn't say your father who sees in public, although he does see in public, right? He doesn't say the father who sees in private. He's seen you around the dinner table. He, he, he's seen you make that cutting remark. He's seen you not follow through on that task maybe the way that you should. He's seen, but he doesn't talk about this. The Father wants to meet you in your secret place. And when, what happens, unfortunately, is your public life can oftentimes be ruined by your private life. And your private life can oftentimes be ruined by your secret life. But what if somebody looked at your private life and was like, man, that's pretty good. And then your private life looks a lot like your public life as well. And they're like, wow, publicly they've got it. Privately they've got it. But what if they looked into your secret life? Woo! And they saw that everything was building on that. And that you were consistent from secret to private to public. And that's the goal, right? Is to be consistent through our life. Now there was um, a, a moment where I uh, looked at Erica's phone once. And uh, let me just say, married couples, you should always have the passcode to your spouse's phone and all of their passwords. If you don't, get marriage counseling right away. Oh, somebody needs to go do that right now. All right, so we have each other's passwords. We have each other's codes. I wasn't trying to snoop on her phone. I may have done that once or twice. I wasn't trying to do that this time. And I open up her phone, type in her passcode. She doesn't know where I'm going with this. Don't worry, this is a good story. And uh, I'm looking through it, and we were in a tough season at the time. You ever been in a tough season just where you're... Just, it's tough, not for anything in particular, it's just a tough season. And so I'm looking through here and I didn't, I grabbed the phone because mom was upstairs and I grabbed her phone and I open it up and her internet browser's open. And I see that she has this list, like several different pages up, of different prayers and different scripture verses and different things that are helping support her and therefore support our family during a tough season. And I'm going, man, what a blessing it is to see somebody's secret life support the private life that then supports the public life. And as I'm looking through that, a text message comes in. I'm like, well, do we have the same phone plan? We're, we're one flesh. I can read your text messages. <laughs> you ever have that where your spouse reads and responds to your text message? You're like, no, don't respond that way. <laughs> All right, just us. Um, so a text message comes through, and, and I open it up. It was one of her best friends, and I see that they're like texting back and forth prayer requests about what's happening in our life. And there, there isn't this list of like, man, my husband should do this and my husband should do that. No, it was this, uh, pray for this way. This is incredible. It was, I, I'm telling you, I was so encouraged by what was happening. And so often, if somebody gets your phone, you're like, oh, no, give it back. You can't see. What if they saw it and it was beautiful? What if it was congruent throughout? What if you need a season of 40 days where not your public life is the factor, not your private life, but your secret life is where God wants to work on you? At some point, we need to be a church that stops just playing the church game, but gets it right in the secret place. And that is what 40 forward is all about, us moving in that direction. And there's a lie that says the best part of our life has to be on social media. I don't want the best part of my life to be out there. 
I want the best part of my life to be the best part of my life, and I want it to be the secret spot, and it bleeds over into the private spot, and it bleeds over into the public spot. And so as the worship team is starting to make their way back up right now, I want to read this to you one more time and see if this passage impacts you the way that it impacted me when I read it earlier this week. And when you fast, as in you should fast, it's not a question of if you should, it's when. If you're a believer in Jesus, welcome to club fasting. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites as the should be. Don't put on this parade like, oh, I'm so spiritual, I'm taking 40 days and I'm suffering for the Lord so that he can... No, it's not about the image of it. Like, let's just drop the image and seek the Savior. Yeah. Let's just stop all the other stuff and hone in on the main thing. When you fast, don't look like the hypocrites. Lord, don't let there be hypocrisy that's found in me. For they disfigure their faces, they put on the show, yada, yada, yada. But when you fast, anoint your head with oil, wash your face, put your best foot forward, essentially, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. There's a reward at the end of this. And that's not the goal. We don't, we don't try just to make this reward take place. But I'm telling you, if you seek the face of the Father in the secret, there will be an eternal reward. There'll be a heavenly reward. There'll even be an earthly reward for it. And so here's my, my ask to you. We're, we're about two weeks away from starting this 40-day season. And I have huge expectation for what's going to happen. And it's not because of me. It's not because of you. It's because I know who I'm going after, right? And he's been consistent every single season of my life. He's proven himself faithful. He's been the one that when I get it wrong, he puts me back in place. He's been the one that could care less about the public image. He just wants my heart. And he wants your heart. And he's ready to meet with you during this season. And so if you're in the room right now, I invite you to stand to your feet. Even if you're watching online, maybe you need to adjust your posture for a moment. And I want us just to ask the Lord how he would want us to be a part of the season. Maybe pray to him during this time and ask, what is it that you need to lay down? What is it that you have been gripping onto so hard that you put your trust in that more than your trust in Jesus? They said there's nothing like your first love. And your first love is the one who created you, the one who knows every single part of you, the one where there's no mystery. The beautiful thing about the secret is there's no secrets in the secret place, right? And even though he sees you in secret, he loves you in secret. And he loves you in private, he loves you in public as well. But ask the Lord, what is it that you want for me to submit to you during this time? Maybe it's a meal. Maybe it's that, that one thing of food you feel like always brings you comfort. Maybe it's a certain rhythm in your life. Maybe God is calling some of you for 40 days to get rid of solid foods and just to trust in Him during that season. I don't know what the Lord's going to call you to do, but I know He's going to call you to something because He tells us in this Word. And so, Lord, we pray right now you would help us digest this passage and this message and that we would not try to live by bread alone but we would recognize that we can live by every word that comes from the mouth of you Lord and for the things that have become hindrances to our personal growth for things that have become hindrances to our family growth for things that have become a hindrance to our societal growth. Lord, we pray during this season you would make us aware, we would see with spiritual eyes what we ought to do during this season. 
God, I pray for direction for myself and my family. I pray for direction for our church. And Lord, we are hope-filled as we look into this season of 44, believing that because of you, Jesus, that incredible things are to come. We pray this in the name of Jesus.